the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Welcome to a new week of interesting bits of history with This Week in Royal History. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. Now, I created this series to encourage fans of the show to dig a little deeper into all royal history, because it's through understanding the past that we get a better idea of why people did the things they did. This week, we begin our journey in beautiful Lisbon, Portugal, overlooking the Tagus River to the south with views of the Atlantic Ocean to the west. It's 1436 when our event happens, but in order to tell the story properly, we must first travel back to 14th century England and John of Gaunt. The daughter of John of Gaunt and his queen consort, Blanche of Lancaster, was Philippa, or Philippa of Lancaster, as you would probably know her. Philippa was married to John I of Portugal in 1387. And while the marriage was not a love match, the couple had many children together. And their son Edward would go on to become king of Portugal after his father's death in 1433. But Philippa, sadly, would not have the opportunity to see her son become king. She had died 16 years earlier of the plague before he ascended the throne. On her deathbed, Philippa called her sons to her bedside so she could give them her blessing and to present them with jewel-encrusted swords, which they would use in their upcoming knighthoods. She also gave them each a portion of the true cross, instructing them to preserve their faith and fulfill the duties of their rank. One of those sons present was the future King Edward of Portugal. Often referred to as Edward the King Philosopher or Edward the Eloquent, it would appear that this king had heeded his mother's deathbed instructions. Three years into his reign, the royal couple already had several children, and it was this week in royal history, 1436, that a daughter was born in Lisbon. Infanta Caterina, or Princess Catherine. Not much is known about Catherine, which is why I gave you so much backstory. But what has been said is that she was considered ambitious, shrewd, and willful, much like her sisters Joan and Eleanor. Whether that is true or not will have to be left unanswered. I often find it interesting when very little is known about a woman's history, but it was evidently known that she was ambitious and shrewd. So we don't know much about her, but she was ambitious and shrewd. <laughs> it definitely comes off as a sexist remark. And let's be honest, a woman's sole purpose at the time was to produce sons and children. So Princess Catherine was betrothed to Charles IV of Navarre. Unfortunately, he died before the marriage could take place. And with Catherine's sisters already marrying the King of Castile and the Holy Roman Emperor, a marriage alliance through Catherine was no longer needed. So she turned to a religious life at the convent of St. Clair. She authorized many religious books and died on the 17th of June, 1463, at 26 years old. You could say our next person was the complete opposite of Catherine of Portugal and that she wasn't a nun. But what they do have in common is that this woman has been unjustly vilified for a long time as a terrible mother. I'm, of course, talking about Lady Frances Brandon, mother of Lady Jane Grey. Lady Frances Brandon was born in 1517 to Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, and Mary Tudor, Dowager Queen of France. Mary, as you know, was a sister of King Henry VIII. Frances was a childhood friend of her cousin Mary, future Mary I, and was close to her aunt, Catherine of Aragon. In 1533, she married Henry Grey, Marquess of Dorset at Suffolk Place, and they had three daughters. Frances's mother died shortly after their wedding. Frances was one of the highest-ranking women at courts, and because of that, she led the funeral procession for Jane Seymour in 1537. In 1551, her two half-brothers died, and the title Duke of Suffolk was granted to her husband, 
Francis's daughter, Lady Jane Grey, was listed as heir to Edward VI in his device of succession upon his deathbed, passing over Edward's two half-sisters. Jane was proclaimed Queen of England on the 10th of July, 1553, but only reigned for nine days before being deposed by Mary I. Francis's daughter, son-in-law, and husband were all executed in February 1554 for their part. Francis was able to retain some land for her family, but lived in poverty during the reign of Mary I. She married Adrian Stokes, her master of horse, in March 1555. They had three children, but all died in infancy. Francis Brandon Gray Stokes died this week in royal history, 1559, at the age of 42, with her remaining two daughters at her side. She was buried at Westminster Abbey. After traveling by sea from Portugal to England, let's head back across the channel to 17th century France and celebrate the birth of two royal princesses, the daughters of Henry IV of France and Marie de' Medici, Elizabeth and Henrietta Maria. Elizabeth, the elder of the two sisters, became Queen of Spain, while Henrietta Maria became Queen of England. As the older sister, Elizabeth was born in 1602, while Henrietta was born in 1609. As their first daughter, Elizabeth was referred to as Madame Royale. In 1610, when Elizabeth was just eight years old and Henrietta only one, their father was assassinated, and their brother Louis became King Louis XIII of France. It was under their brother's reign that the two sisters' marriages were arranged. An interesting fact about Elizabeth, her daughter, Maria Theresa, married Louis XIV of France. And an interesting fact about Henrietta Maria, the U.S. state of Maryland is named in her honor. Next, we travel through time from 17th century France to 19th century Victorian England, with the birth of Maud Charlotte Mary Victoria in 1869. Maud was born this week in history to Albert Edward, Prince of Wales, and future Edward VII, and Alexandra of Denmark. Through her father, Maud was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Maud and her two sisters received the Imperial Order of the Crown of India in 1887. The order was established by Queen Victoria when she became Empress of India in 1878. The order was open to women only. Prior to her first marriage, Maud had hoped to wed her cousin, Prince Francis of Teck, the younger brother of her sister-in-law, Mary of Teck. And if you know your royal history, that name will ring a bell. Mary of Teck was Queen Consort of King George V and Grandmother of Queen Elizabeth II. So Maud wanted to wed Prince Francis of Teck. But Francis appears completely uninterested in Maud, which is interesting because marrying someone like Maud could have easily solved his ever-building gambling debt. So he paid no interest in her. Instead, she married her first cousin, Prince Karl of Denmark. The private ceremony was held at Buckingham Palace. The couple had one son together, named Prince Alexander, in 1903, and two years later, things would change for this royal family. Norway was considering its first king since 1387. They had formed a committee, and together they identified who the best candidates for the position would be throughout all European royalty. As an ideal candidate, Prince Karl topped the list. And it didn't hurt that his wife was a British princess and that they had a son and heir all ready to go. As queen, Maud had a dominant and strong role at court and supported charities associated with animals and children. She visited England every year and never lost her love for her home country. She even attended the coronation of her nephew and niece, 
George VI, and Queen Elizabeth in 1937. The following year, during a visit to England, Maud became ill. She had abdominal surgery on the 16th of November, 1938. Her husband traveled to be by her side, and she died unexpectedly four days after her surgery of heart failure. She was 68. And that concludes this week in royal history. I hope to have shared some new stories with you that you can now go on and dig a little deeper because history is always more than what's on the surface. If you appreciate the content you receive on this show, please consider showing your support by becoming a patron on Patreon. Find the link to Patreon wherever you get your podcasts in its show notes. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you again next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.